Let's take our Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, and we will stand. We read some the other night, but I want to read some in chapter 1 and 2 and try to cover some of this tonight. Oh, Joshua, he takes over from Moses. Joshua chapter 1, then some from chapter 2. Just follow me here. Verse 1 and 2, now after the death of Moses... The servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of of Israel. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Eight and nine. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Chapter 2, 1 through 4. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men and hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the women took the two men and hid them. Verse 8 through 11. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, Sihon, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above, and in earth beneath. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. Thank you. We're talking on this journey in Joshua. We're going to talk a lot about courage. And then we'll talk some more about conviction and confession. Now I want to begin tonight With the story of Miss Thompson teaching her Sunday school class of kids about God. We're going to learn some great things about God in the book of Joshua. But she was going to teach her children in the Sunday school class about the Trinity. God as three persons. One God in three persons. Well, she imagined them to look at a pretzel. I don't know if she drew the pretzel it said or she designed the pretzel there in the classroom. So she made the three loops, but it made it into a size of a pretzel. Well, 
She said, children, the first one is like God the Father. The second one is God the Son, Jesus. The third is the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. So she said, do you follow what I'm trying to teach you about the one true God? The three circles come together, but they make one whole. They said, yes. So she said, Jimmy, she looked over at Jimmy, said, Jimmy, I want you to tell me what you know about God concerning the pretzel. He said, well, let's see. The first one is God the Father. She said, good. Then he said, the second one is Jesus. And then he said, well, let's see. God, holy smoke. Well, you'll catch on after a while, I guess. We talked about, in chapter 1 with Joshua, the second verse, Wednesday night, God called Joshua on a mission. What was his mission? To take over Moses' place. Moses had died, and so his mission was to lead the people of Israel. He was Moses' right-hand man. If you see in the scripture there, it calls him Moses' ministry. He was Moses' assistant, associate, servant, however you want to call that. He was the second man in the leadership of Israel. Now, he takes over first place. So God's mission in verses 1 through 4. Now, in verse 5, we want to look at God's presence. Now, the Bible says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses. So what is he going to do? So I will be with you. I won't fail you or forsake you. Do you believe God is present in your life? If you don't, you, your faith, you're missing something about faith. God says he is with us. He will be with us. He will not fail us nor forsake us. As he was with the forefathers of old, he would be with his people uh, today through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's look further about God's courage. Verses 6 through 9. Joshua knew what it meant to have God's courage. Be strong and of a good courage. He was to go inherit the land, but he needed to observe the law. That represents the word of God and be not afraid. Do you have courage tonight? What is courage? It can be defined as a mental or moral strength to persevere. Is the church persevering today, enduring, continuing on in faith? Are you able to withstand danger, fear, and difficulty? Are you brave and strong? What did Paul, as a prisoner, when he wrote to Timothy, what did he say? God has not given you a spirit of what? Of fear, but of power. Power. Of love and of a sound mind, sound discipline, self-control. He gave him courage. He poured it in him. Only the Lord can do that. If you're walking with the Lord, you can have his courage. If you're not walking, you won't have his courage. Look at verse 7. Where did this courage come from? Be strong and a very courageous that you may observe of obey the law. Obey his word. You're not going to turn to the right or the left. It means you're going to keep Israel on course, Joshua. Following after me. Focus on my commands, my words. You can claim the promised land. Now here's where the real metal, or the foot meets the pedal, or the metal, or however you call that, in verse 8, 
This book of the law. What was the book of the law? Really it stood for the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometimes when they said the book of the law could represent Deuteronomy, which is going over the laws of God. But here it says this book of the law may represent the first five books of the Old Testament. Well, anyway, it represents here the word of God. It shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt. What are we going to do with the word of God? Not only for Joshua, for us, meditate day and night. Now, I know that some people do yoga. And they do all these stretches and all. I wish I could turn my legs like some of these pictures you've seen with the yoga people. I wish I could do that. It might help my muscles and nerves and all that. But I don't want any part of Eastern mysticism or Hindu religious activities, you see. I don't want to be putting my mind into a transcendental type of meditation. This has nothing to do with that in the Word of God. It means to stay in the Word of God, open it, read what it says, listen to God, pray over it, ask God for wisdom, think about it. Think about it daily. You ever wake up in the morning thinking about, I was telling Dave on Wednesday night, I woke up and thinking about a special song that morning. You see, God will do that as you walk with him. So it is in the word. As you start reading something in the word, take it with you during the day. You don't have to take a, an 8 by 12 big book of a Bible to the workplace or something like that. No. You can put the Word of God in your heart. You can have it. You have a little testament in your pocket. Now we have it on your phone. You can put the Bible, a different translations, or right on the phone. So, think about the Word of God. Quote it. Mark it. The Word is foundational because it's God's Word. It's God's truth. And to give you courage in your daily walk of life. You do want to seek the mind of Christ, don't you? So read it carefully. Think about it prayerfully. Apply it appropriately. Like the psalmist said, Psalm 1, He delights in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. Shall be like the tree planted by the rivers of water. So, God's courage, God commanded it, and Joshua had it, and he went forward for the Lord. Now, let's move further. Chapter 2. <clears throat> we move to an interesting person here in the first verse. Her name is Rahab. Joshua is sending out spies for the land of Jericho. Now, they're going to have to go march and take Jericho. That was the next place. They had to go to the conquest to go into the promised land. Now, who does God use? In chapter 2, verse 1, it says harlot. Uh, I think a more modern term today would be prostitute. Now, if God can use a prostitute to further his kingdom's work, how much more can he use us? Who was a shepherd boy raised to be a king? Tell me. King David. Who was a farmer raised to be a prophet? Amos of Tekoa. Who was a man who ate bugs? John the Baptist. Well, I'll tell you what, I ain't messing with him. I can learn from him, but I ain't going to walk with him. I'm not planning to. Did you hear about people, they, they eat chocolate-covered bugs and all like that? David, you've tried them before? He was all right? Oh, oh, that's, let's move along here. Anyway, God used dear John the Baptist to be the forerunner, the leader before Jesus came, to point the way to Jesus. Fishermen. Oh, it's different fishermen in the Bible. We know great Peter became the great preacher. 
Paul. What was Paul? A tent maker. Now God's using here a prostitute. He can change a person's life for his glory. Now, as we said, they're going to spy out the land. And the king finds out about it through his men. Verse 3, king of Jericho gets the word. She's hid the spies. Now, we didn't read the part there in the first, in verses uh, 5 through 7. She hid them under some flax stalks up on the rooftop. Probably, I don't know what a flax stalk looked like, but anything like corn stalks and things like that, you know, you can pile them up if you pile things up in certain areas and it covered them, you know. And she told them that they had already gone. But now look at verses 8 through 10. We see the conviction God places upon people. Conviction. She convicted by the knowledge of God. And she saith unto the men, I know that the Lord, that is, the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah God, Yahweh, Lord God, the everlasting God, has given you the land in that your terror has been fallen upon us. We're fearful of you people. She was given knowledge of that, that God's almighty hand, you could not conquer him. You could not outdo God, uh, the true God. You could not have victory over God. They had gods in Jericho, surely. They worshiped their kinds of gods. But the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, was the true God. Are you fearful of God? I think there's, there's two kinds of fear. Now, we talk about the fear of the Lord many times in the Bible. It talks about great reverence for God. We understand that. Have all of God, great respect for a holy God. But I think there is a, a, uh, another kind of fear. I think I would be afraid of God. Do you know that? Is not God the judge of all the earth? Now, God loves us, but he judges sin. And a lot of times, people don't get that. They say, well, God, our God is a God of love, but they don't understand that sin leads to judgment. You get the picture? So, I think about the story of Dr. Brown was his name. He was an old Presbyterian minister, one of the first men I'd met pastors we had a little ministers group in my, the first church I was only was 24 I think I went that year so I'd be 24 years old and uh, in the little town where I um, passed around the countryside but he was in town he's 81 at that time so I was talking to him one day I don't know we're eating or we're in the meeting the group of the different pastors and he said, Brother Don, I never forget, I was 10 years old, and a preacher talked about hell, a message on hell. And he said, he scared the hell out of me. <laughs> really, he, was, he said, actually, actually. That evening, some, he talked to his parents, and all. He, he, he was broken. He said, he wasn't going to no hell. No way. He believed that God was a great God of judgment against sin, and he just couldn't take it, even as a young fellow of 10 and he came to Jesus. So, sometimes we get the wrong picture. It doesn't mean that God didn't love him. He knew that God loved him through Jesus and died for him. But he didn't want to perish and go to hell. So, I thought that was a very a powerful picture. And I think this is a picture of dear Rahab. She knew, convicted in her heart, of the wonder and the power and the judgment the terror of God. She heard about his power. Look at verse 10. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. I mean, how many people, you get people many places in the world today, they, they know about that God dried up the Red Sea for Israel. One of the great events of all history. I mean, 
uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. And you can speak to even people who have no idea much about the Bible. And they've heard about that. So she had heard about it. And the conviction of Rahab was, was a, a proof. And uh, God proved it to her how great he was. I'd say tonight we need to learn something about conviction for Rahab about life. There's always a better way to live. Her lifestyle, like many, have brought her to great needs of life physically and spiritually. She was on the path of destruction, of death, eventually hell. But the tidings of salvation can be poured out through God's grace for all of us. I think about the story of Tom Landry. Many of you remember Tom Landry, don't you? He died a few years ago. He's a great coach many years of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, for years, he did not know Jesus or trust the Lord. He knew about Christmas and Easter. He'd go to church maybe with his family, make an acknowledgement of God, but he didn't really trust the Lord. And a friend invited him to a Bible study. You know what the Bible study was about? The book of Romans. The book of Romans. And there he understood about sin and righteousness of God and the grace of God, redemption. God delivers us through his blood. And so he gave his life to Jesus. It's made known how to change his life. Someone waiting to come to Jesus. You've got to be convicted. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Look also tonight about confession. In verse 11. As soon as we'd heard these things, our hearts didn't melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Prophet Daniel said, guys, you're going to learn something. There is a God in heaven. You're going to learn that there in Babylon. They did. Rahab Hearts melted. It brought to their knees, you might say, self-confident hearts melted like wax. Anybody melted wax lately in heat? I have, I guess, years ago. We did them dealing with kids or something like that, but I haven't. But it's really a picture of this, the block being there and you touch the heat and it melts right away. That's how the hearts did. We picture powerful sports teams. I saw a little bit of football in the last few days. I saw some of this Science Hill and uh, Dobbins Bennett. I, I saw some people melting down. I got some people getting run over. I mean, I mean it, was, it was some powerful pictures there, you know. And uh, I, hate it. I would hate it being on the other side sometimes of people running or, or uh, with that ball. But anyway, Rahab was convicted of God's power, who God is. What do you confess about God tonight? Who is he? Someone asks you tomorrow on your, at the workplace and all, you say, I, I'd like for you to come to our church and visit and uh, give a bulletin. They said, well, who is your God? Can we say like Rahab? There's only one true God. He's a God of heaven above and here on this earth and under the earth. But we've got to tell them about Jesus, don't we? The God who made himself known in Jesus. He came to this earth, fully God, became fully man, went to a cross, died on the cross, shed his blood for us so that we could be forgiven of sin, took our sins upon himself. He was buried. 
third day rose again and he lives and he's coming back would you like to know more about it what are we going to confess about the greatness and the power of God it involves personal decision you know dear Rahab could have heard about God and just went on her way she could have turned the guys over they were not part of her country why didn't she turn them over to the king I mean, she could have saved her life with the, with the people she thought but God did something inside of her See, it's always something on the inside it's not what we think always looking at it from the outside it's not an outward thing it's an inward change a transformation of the heart who is God he is the Lord our God you know there's different times in ministry as we talk about God someone comes to me several years ago there are different people who said well I know why you became a pastor a minister I said you do I said your father was a preacher I said, whoa, wait a minute. The last time I ever heard, my daddy was a farmer. Never knew anything about preaching. Oh, he preached to us as boys. Get out of that bed and get ready. Get out of that field. Get in the hog pen. And get on the tractor or something like that. He said, well, your brothers were in ministry. I said, no. I said, it's not my mother or my father. It's not my brothers or the sister. It's not relatives or friends. It's not the church family. It's God, the true God. He called me, chose me, picked me out. Out of all the family members, all cousins, all kinds of relatives, I don't really know of anybody who became a minister. Even music, Dave. Even any kind of uh, minister leadership, ministry. I know there's numbers of Christians in the families. But I'm saying uh, like in full-time ministry that I know of. It's a personal. It's the Lord God who made himself known. His wonderful grace. What will you do with Jesus? For Rahab, it was, what are you going to do about the Lord God and what you know about him? You know, it's interesting. People can go to revival services, go to special services, go to special singings, go to all kinds of churches. But once you turn the message to a personal message what have you done with Jesus who is Jesus what is sin why, why are you going to go to heaven right, do you think would you like to go to heaven well why would you go to heaven when you get personal there is a decision you don't know they need to come and make that personal confession to Jesus. You know, we're helpless and hopeless apart from the true God in Christ. Dead in trespasses and sins. All sinners by nature and by choice. We need a Savior. Not our self-righteousness. Not all of our good works. Without Christ's righteousness, imputed, place given to us, Accounted to our record. Unless that happens. We cannot be saved. Jesus is all the world to me, the great hymn says. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night. 
He's my friend. Do you know him? You know his personal friend, personal savior, personal Lord? Have you confessed him? Wouldn't it be a good time to do that? You need to confess him personally as your Savior Lord. Do you need to confess him and come into the life of the church? Be a part of his church family? Do you need to call upon him, confess him in a time of prayer? That you need him more, you need his wonderful courage to live. If God is speaking, you come. Let's stand together, would we?